Survey the scene with that lovely rain falling here at Port Melbourne. It's time to catch up with uh, one of the legends of the game. In fact, it's time to catch up with two of the legends of the game as we welcome Phil Cleary. You know, I love planting my feet on the Port Melbourne turf. I first came here in 1975. The borough were the reigning premier. They drew the crowds like no one else. Just imagine this ground ringed by supporters painters and dockers, wharfies, women with false teeth in bags were being hurled at you out on the turf. It was special. Who to believe that over the next seven years this side would win five premierships? What a team the borough was. And they produced some tough footballers. A bloke by the name of Bobby Prophet was roaming around the back half where I happened to play. And who can forget that day in 1976 when John Scholes was wandering through here with those bandy legs powering away and Prophet collected him with an elbow. The eye was cut, the blood poured out. They stitched him up at half time and he came out wearing what people said was a damn turban. A bloke in a turban playing football, they said, the borough people to my rear. But Scalzi just powered on. We won the game by 16 goals and Port Melbourne won the premiership. But throughout all of those premierships, there was one bloke who stood out. He was a champion, an absolute legend. That man was Fred Cook. This was his patch. We're going to talk to him. Fred Cook, the greatest VFA player I ever saw. And here am I talking to you in the Port Grandstand. Great to see you. You haven't got an air sickness bag there. I, thank you. No, it's, it's great. To be, I haven't been back in this ground for many years. I really haven't, Phil. And... Uh, it's still, uh, still get butterflies in the tummy. Just have a look at the beautiful ground that it is at the moment. I'm sure you do, Fred, but before you got to Port, you were at the Doggies. You played more than 30 games before you were 21 years of age. Why did a player with your talent leave league football? Short stories. The management at Footscray didn't have the capacity to handle 18 and 19 year olds like they do today. And uh, I had a silly dispute out of going to Charlie Sutton, who was a premiership captain and coach. I went to his home to have a drink on a Sunday with my wife and kids, and I got dropped to the seconds because of it. And um, then I got an offer um, to go to the VFA, and it was a great game in those days. It was just, it was really just on the on the precipice of being a, you know, the huge game it was for the next you know, two or three decades. So you went to Yarraville. Your money was paid for by a publican and a barber. Tell us about that. In 1968, I played every league game for Footscray. I played in two games at the South Melbourne Oval and won a night premiership. And on pay night, I got $875 for the year. Arguably, Ted Whitten, captain coach, best football in the land, was uh, yeah, coach. He got $1,300. And uh, I went to Yarraville and I, they offered me $4,000 cash, which was a huge amount. And I said, I really need a house for my wife and kids. I'm in a flat. And he said, well, go and buy a house and, and send me the bill. And um, that, that was all a handshake. It was just a handshake. Well, then the door opened to another stunning career at Port Melbourne. You got over a heart attack, and Ian Collins put you down to the goal square, and you never looked back. Well, I, uh, I went to Port because they were always a great club. They were like Collingwood. We hated them, but we loved them. And uh, Norm Goss knocked on my flat door one, one night and uh, offered me some phenomenal amount of money, like about ninety dollars I think. I didn't get much more twenty years later. But uh, I just had something I just had a feel for the man who was, was sitting in his stand, the wrong guy stand here. And uh, I uh, I wanted to be part of success and I think every footballer does. It's sort of say, oh we'll stay in languish in the bottom sides and all that, but everyone wants to play in a premiership and it's nice to yeah, I think it's a bit coy when play, players oh you know, I'd swap a brand line for a premiership, but I can see where that, that comes from. You know, it's something you can share with somebody else. The premierships just rolled on. 1974 was special. But I've got to say, Fred, your performance in the 1976 grand final, I have never seen anything like, and I think I never will. To get knocked over by Alan Harper in the way you did and get back up off the turf in front of 30,000 people and kick five goals was sheer courage. Well, courage isn't the, the uh, absence of fear, it's a mastery over it. Now, if any of the things that I did was uh, boring on being courageous, I never thought about it. Because if I had to think about it, I probably wouldn't have done it. And I think that's most things we see people being um, portrayed as heroes in, in newspapers and TV news and that. And I think if they had to really sit down and give it a lot of thought, they wouldn't do it. It's just, just a natural reaction. 
And I think here, um, not like a good self, I didn't get into too much trouble, but I never took a backward step, and I was always proud of that. You were taken in and stitched up. Well, you didn't leave the ground. You were stitched up at half time in the 76 grand final by a doctor by the name of Madden. Lynn Madden, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Lynn Madden. Did you know Lynn Madden particularly well? I don't like the smirk on your face. Yes, yeah, she's a friend of mine. But in 1976, Alan Harper, uh, who, uh, who smashed me in the face, he, uh, I've got no animosity towards the bloke, but he told everyone else before the game, if Cook makes a fool out of me, I'm going to knock him out. That's fair enough, but he told everyone, but he didn't tell me. I would have kept that of his road. And when he, uh, I kicked the goal from uh, half a metre out, and I, which I've never done since, stood at the end of the goal screen and gave him time to build up his anger, and he just Tom bowled me in, hit me and put a big flap of meat here in my face. And at half time, I remember lying on the table, and the doctor with no anaesthetic because they didn't use it in those days, putting these bag needles in my face. And my dad was holding one arm, and the head trainer was holding the other, and the doctor was sewing me up, and old man Goss walked past, and I said, Oh, sorry about this, Norm, who are you going to play full forward? He looked at me rather angry, he said, what's wrong with you? He said, you don't run on your face, and walked away. And my dad had tears in his eyes, you know, and, and that's, I've got to, I'm going to kick another couple of goals, but I, yeah, I didn't expect that reaction from him. Fred, more than 1,300 goals in 300 VFA games, but you probably averaged six goals a game playing with Port Melbourne. How did you do that? Can I tell you a little secret? My mother could have kicked all those goals. Now, I do say they're a bit tongue-in-cheek. I had a great side in front of me. And I, I've always said I did not care, barring two players, who I played on in, in this land at fullback. I was totally relying on my teammates. And I really only needed a break of that much. And the fullback was dead. As simple as I could catch the ball. And I, had, I played in... It's not a coincidence that I was in a good side, a great side, with great players. And the likes that could uh, yeah, stab kick a ball at any position on the ground. One of my coaches said you were a cheat for not playing in the league, or the VFL as it was then known, for playing VFA. You should have been up with the big boys. He said, Fred Cook's a cheat. What do you think about that? Well, I tried. Well, I didn't try. Uh, Ron Josephs, who was the um, administrator at North Melbourne, him and I, uh, reluctantly, I sat down and had a chat to him because they needed the full forward in 76. In, sorry, 77. 70, 77, they needed a full forward. Snake Baker was full forward, and he didn't look like he was going to come up that season. And I couldn't get a clearance from Footscray. Twelve years later, they wouldn't clear me. And his exact words were, Fred, we wish you well at Port Melbourne. Uh, it would be cheaper for us to pursue Peter Hudson. Good luck. And uh, I can't, but I was, Would you have kicked 100 goals at the Kangaroos that year? Yes. Only for the same reason that the skill level that I had here at Port Melbourne was up the ante by another 30 or 40 per cent. Like you had players of calibre Schimmelbush and mm. Blight and Cable. And, uh, and I thought, I've only got to get four, four kicks a week, it's 100 goals. And how could you forget those three premierships, 1980, 81, 82? You weren't even favourite in 80 and 82, and yet you won the flag. But the thing is, you were the star player. I say Port Melbourne wouldn't have won those flags without you. The pressure that was on me personally, I sit back and think about it now, it was ginormous because it wasn't so much... It wasn't so much uh, me or personal stuff like my family. It was uh, the kids here. It's, uh, you know, it's a thousand kids running around with number five in the back. And there were times when you know, they come up, they didn't have a life, they didn't single parents, they didn't ministry housing. And this was, this Working was their Disneyland. Class. Yeah, this was their Disneyland. And, uh, you know, we all got to have our heroes. And I, um, I, uh, I took it on board a lot with the kids because uh, and I never, uh, with the television cameras, I, I used to smoke. I'd just have a smoke a quarter time, I'd have a smoke at three quarter time. And, but the, the camera guys were terrific, you know. I'll do any interviews you like, but please don't put a camera on when I'm having a smoke. Let's do the right thing. Um, but the kids, and I knew that I was setting an example for the kids in those days, and um, yeah, I wouldn't put up with them swearing, and being disrespectful. And there you were on top of the world. Six premierships, hundreds and hundreds of goals, your own pub in Port Melbourne, everyone loved you. Everyone thought you were special, and you descended into amphetamines. Why? Oh, because I didn't like it. Of course, I, I, let's go, let's get the drug issue over. No one. Um, people are never really honest with themselves. You know, it, it's like uh, going to an AA meeting, and uh, they never get up and say, "I love alcohol. I'd love to get drunk now, but I don't want the consequences." And I love amphetamines. I used to love the feeling of being high spirit and and doing all the reckless things, it was terrific. But nowadays, I don't want the consequences. In 1985, you left Port Melbourne and you went to Moorabbin. Were you on drugs when you were playing at yeah. Moorabbin? Yes. Did it enhance your performance? No. 
No, no, I'll tell you why, because the, um, the extra burst of energy you get uh, is offset by trying to attempt a hundred little, little jobs. Like if you're in the kitchen, you'd be washing the knives, you'd be changing the lining on the bottom of the drawers, and you never complete one task. And you, your head's just like a, a, a mix master going around. No, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't advise it now. Well, you've been through it, Fred. What is Ben Cousins experiencing at the present time? Oh, just uh, his low self-esteem, he's fallen from grace. He, suddenly he's hero worship, well he still is, but he's got this problem now. And the last place I'd be going was a $17,000 a day rehab. You know, I'd be sitting there in a Fedicum rehab where, you know, you're sitting there eating chopped carrots and uh, no television and um, sitting down no, and just getting your life back. And it's no good, you can't rehab being pampered, it's not on. It might be for the first week, but you've got to get back to reality. And is the Fred Cook that I loved and everyone loved in the 70s and early 80s back to normal? Oh, as normal as it can be, yeah. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not bulletproof. Um, and I want to hang around a lot longer. I've got you know, some lovely children that um, just so pure at the moment, I want it to stay that way. But they know all about me, that's the beauty. They you know, like, know I'm a bad habit my kids and they still love me anyway. I'm not a bad bloke, Phil, really. I know you're not. Right, let's put the bad times behind us. Let's go back to those glorious VFA days when you truly were a legend. Was there one game that really stands out? The 1980 grand final, because your side, Coburg, should have won it. And we come back from the dead, and I still sit back now, and, you know, I can watch that game again and, and still don't know, think we might get beaten, you know? It was just that, and from our point of view, and I'm, yes. I'm sorry you happen to be on the opposite side, but. The way they, they lifted and come back from the dead and overcome all adversity and against a very good side, my ad. Um, and I think if the game had been played at another time, uh, I think the result would have been different. I really do. Fred Cook, I've always loved you and I wish you a long and happy life. Your dad's nearly 84, Fred Senior, and he's still alive, so we should see a lot more of you. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very candid conversation between Phil Cleary and one of the VFA legends in Fred Cook.